You're listening to The Roundup Podcast, a podcast on reaching the college campus, developing leaders, and sending out kingdom multipliers. This podcast is created by the Southern Baptists of Texas Convention and provided through cooperative program giving. Well, howdy, friends, and welcome to The Roundup Podcast. I'm your host, Mitch Tidwell. I'm lucky today to have a new co-host today, a guest co-host, Mitchell Johnson. Mitchell, what's up, man? What's up, y'all? Glad to be here. Oh, man, glad to have you. Man, we're excited. We're going to talk around Gen Z today about leading Gen Z. But before we do that, I uh, just want to let you know, in May 11th through 13th, we're going to have Roundup. That's going to be uh, in Fort Worth, Texas. That is an event designed around uh, reaching, developing, and sending college students. Would love for you to be there. You can register at sbtexas.com uh, forward slash roundup. We would love to see uh, you there. Bring you, bring yourself, bring your students, and uh, it'll be a good time. So, all right, hey, getting on with the show, we're talking around Gen Z, leading Gen Z, uh, things for us to know, maybe barriers to stay away from uh, as we're leading uh, this strategic group of people. And so I brought on today, uh, Grant Skeldon and Luke Lefevre. Friends, how are y'all doing? Good, good. Oh, man. Doing glad great. Thanks for having me on. Man, glad to have you guys on. Grant's been a, um, a sweet friend that was in Dallas who started the Initiative Network, which is a movement of millennials uh, in Dallas and, and really was uh, raising up missionaries, like local missionaries in Dallas, who's now in Nashville. He'll say a little bit about himself here in just a second. And then I met Luke last year. Uh, in 2021, uh, he is the director of Consecrate Movement he'll, that he'll share about here in just a second. But uh, guys, thanks for being on. So glad to have you. Uh, hey, as we get going, um, for those that don't have context uh, for you, I'd love for you just to introduce yourself, who you are, what you do, where you're from. And, and Grant, let's start with you, brother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So from Dallas for a long time, got married a year ago, moved to Nashville two weeks later and took a job as the next gen director. For Q Ideas, uh, that's led by Gabe Lyons and Rebecca Lyons. Uh, Gabe started Catalyst a long time ago, Catalyst Conference, and then uh, about 18 years ago he started Q Ideas. So I'd say, well, Catalyst was for leadership, especially church leadership. Q is for Christians and culture, and just discussing and thinking, um, and just being yeah, biblical and thoughtful and winsome in what's going on in our nation. Uh, the, the whole concept of having the Bible in one hand. In the newspaper and the other and instead of mm -hmm. leading by fear but having hope but also uh, uh, good awareness of uh, what is God doing um, where is there signs of life and so uh, we do a big national conference every year that's next month uh, April 20th to the 29th at the belonging and then behind the scenes I also do a lot of uh, retreats uh, for high capacity young Christian leaders in the church but especially uh, again Christians and culture uh, authors, musicians, speakers, professional athletes, um, any online influencers like actors, actresses, just like Christians that are in the culture that if a Gen Z person was not maybe going to church, which many unfortunately are not, they would maybe watch these guys, subscribe to their channels, see them on TV, um, listen to the lyrics and their music. And just think it's so crucial that uh, we don't just train pastors for the church, but also missionaries for the culture. And so uh, trying to make sure that those guys that are out there um, are healthy, that they potentially finish well, that they um, yeah, can get poured into and have a place where they could also take their cape off um, and don't have to find their identity in this, this very unique gift that they have as well. Man, that's awesome. Thanks, Grant. Luke, how about yourself? Yeah, yeah. I, uh, like you said, my name's Luke Lefever. Like Grant, uh, I got married just a little over a year ago as well. So Grant and I both uh, had 2020 weddings, which was uh, quite interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, uh, yeah, just uh, got married just a little over a year ago and uh, just had our first baby uh, four weeks ago. So in the thick of that. <laughs> Um, so if you're wondering why I have this weird pink wall behind me, it's because I'm in the nursery and it's the only <laughs> place I can guarantee that will be quiet uh, yeah. for a little bit here. So, um, yeah, my wife and I live in Nashville here, been here, actually born and raised in Nashville, been doing college ministry here for about several years. But currently uh, we lead a, a ministry called Consecrate, which focuses on calling the next generation into total devotion to Jesus and 
really our, our kind of God goal, God dream with that is over the next 10 years to try to rally and mobilize 100,000 students um, to be active in uh, reaching the next generation with the gospel and calling them into that total devotion to both Jesus and his mission. And so um, that's kind of what we're, we're in the thick of right now. Man, that's great, Luke. And if we wanted, so Mitchell just got Johnson, he just got married at the end of December. So if we want, we could just oh, talk on. about being come rookie on. husbands and the bear and the, and the hurdles <laughs> of the wisdom. <laughs> yeah, man. Well, Hey, I, I'm four and a half years in and I say, you know, marriage is not like football. You don't become a veteran at year three, still very much a rookie in every facet of being married. So, and I got Luke, I've got, you know, a two year old and then I have yeah. One that's about four months and, uh, yeah. bro, it's wild, man. So yeah, but, man, two of them that, that way you're, uh, you haven't outnumbered the kids anymore. Like there's, there's one to one now you're getting close to being outnumbered at bro, some point. Here, here's a prayer that I'll say, and I, we're getting off track here, but if you're a young guy who's getting married, having kids, here's the prayer you need. Lord, increase my emotional capacity. That yeah, has been yeah. my prayer. Cause man, every kid, every person, it's like, it's just more to give. So. Really? Um, yeah, I think oh, that's yeah. a good prayer actually for marriage. I, I just I'm gonna use that for marriage, bro. Do it. Well, that's that's what I wanted. That, yeah, that's when I got married. That's what I was like. Hey, I wish somebody would have told me that. Now we have kids. It's like, dang man, I really need some more emotional capacity. But uh, all right, hey, let's get back on track here. Uh, hey Grant, I'd love to hear, man. You you know you're in Dallas. You worked a lot with millennials. Uh, now I know the focus is is you know, probably millennials too, but Gen Z as well, you know, so you're working kind of locally there in Dallas. Now you're gone in that you're in Nashville, kind of working on a more national platform, probably even global platform, man. I'd just be curious to hear how maybe your perspective has changed about the generations and even particular generation Z. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's two things, uh, that probably stick out, especially I'm always trying to listen to trends or like, man, what, when I see, Diverse people from different cities, even especially if they're in different industries, they don't even know each other and they're t- all talking about God doing mm-hmm. something in a place or maybe saying similar things to each other. I feel like that's the privilege of the work that like I get to do and match you get to do is we get to be kind of like mavens of what God is doing. And um, there's probably two things. And one is actually, uh, Luke, I meant to say this to you. Me and Luke spoke at a conference yesterday in Atlanta and got to do a panel and you mentioned the, the, the thing about like, uh, we're so almost obsessed with thinking, how do we reach the next generation? Which me, actually we should say, we said it the way we actually mean it is, how do we get young people to come to this event in our building? Yeah. Uh, that's what we really mean. Um, if we look at our function, like if we look at the function of what we're trying to do, uh, it's really like, how do we get young people in the world to come to this event in our church? Um, and we want more than that. Everyone in, is trying to do that, wants more than that. But that's especially what we're trying to do. And you talked about how uh, you, we kind of like going to where are the young people and let's just like bring it to them. And maybe you'll have a chance to share a little bit of your story of doing that. But because uh, you've done that, uh, there's a guy named Ross Johnston who's doing this thing called California Will Be Saved in the beaches of California. And they just go, there's a lot of people on this beach. I think I've, I've, I think it's St. Saint Monica, but I'm not sure exactly. It's in Newport, actually. So it, they just like start preaching, doing worshiping, uh, uh, praying over anyone that needs prayer. And if they want to get baptized, they just go down the beach and baptize them. And they'll have dozens and sometimes hundreds of people. There's another girl, Jesse Green, uh, who it's almost like this gathering of like grassroots evangelism where it's not like, which I really appreciate guys like Greg Laurie, or um, even like a, sometimes Louie and Passion will go to a city and it's like a year out. Um, there's a group called The Send and for like a year they'll, they'll plan on this big stadium like gathering. Um, but I'm seeing um, also this next gen start doing like these grassroots, like we're not going to go out a year out. It's like this weekend, it doesn't matter if it's thousands, if it's just a couple dozen or if it might even sometimes it ends up being a um, hundred or a couple hundred where they go to so this girl, Jesse went to like Kentucky and just for like 30 days straight, just did like services and prayer and, and all that uh, mm-hmm. in an area for like 30 days. And we don't hear about that in our generation. And even the Xers are, uh, that was more like the, the, what do they call it? The, the Jesus movement, like mm-hmm. where it's like several days, or I think of G, uh, Billy Graham's first 
uh, crusade. From what I understand, it was like a parking lot in LA and it was like a hundred days, wasn't it? Or like just day after day after day. Like, can you, how do you promote that event? That's, <laughs> yeah. a, that's like a, that's a temporary church uh, every yeah. day. Like, yeah. um, but that's when you kind of, I love when you almost start telling stories to God um, moving and it's like hey you know how it's this it's kind of like that but actually it's more it's like you can't explain it you can't put your finger on it you can't point to one person who strategically made it almost seems like god just kept doing something people wanted to keep coming back so there's that and then probably a huge thing that stands out too is that um i have felt like uh as trying to be as quick as possible and seeing this but I, I try to follow the trend of the church and i i've always felt like Church was a sacred event, it sounds like, at some point 40 years ago, 50 years ago, where it's like everyone went to church because it was what you were supposed to do. Even got dressed up to church. That's Mm -hmm. almost comical now to think about dressing up like you were going to a wedding, but you were going to church Mm -hmm. for the next generation, at least. But eventually it it wasn't a sacred event anymore, and people started leaving, and there was the... um, seeker sensitive movement which does get a lot of flack but there was a lot of the reason and the the impetus of doing that was uh there are so many people hurt by the church or lost that guys like um bill hybels like rick warren amy stanley i think ed young jr uh there started being uh, even life church maybe a little bit like started making these churches that was designed for those that were hurt by the church or just very de-churched or unchurched or felt like church was irrelevant and they did start winning over a lot of people that just didn't want to go anymore. Um, but the shadow, because I think every generation swings the pendulum somewhere and then there's a shadow. I think the shadow, of course, as we know, is sometimes that can be a little too comfortable. Sometimes it feels like, oh, we're just safe. Um, I'm not getting challenged. I'm just getting helped in myself, like self-help. It can sometimes feel more motivational and not actually like uh, the conviction to a repentance. Um, sometimes it can be just so slick and there's a lot of fog and and there's a lot of like it's so produce that you're almost losing like that sacredness uh that the generation before came to and then i I point to like well what was the next move and i i just feel like uh xers and i think of matt chandler i think of uh mark driscoll like for our generation all of us are like Mm -hmm. except for luke are like in their (laughs) late 20s early 30s or maybe like mid 30s but man when mark driscoll and matt chandler david platt francis chan those guys were like new fresh voices Mm -hmm. that they weren't seeker sensitive. Um, I always think like they were like Matt Chandler and Mark Driscoll were like literally shouting at young guys to like <laughs> yeah. Yeah, put your pa- <laughs> like put your pants on. Like and, and yeah. some of them were cussing. Some of them yeah. were cussing at us yeah, even. And uh, then I say if they weren't cussing or shouting, guys like Francis Chan and David Platt, who I love, but they were kind of crying and they were yeah. emotional and yeah. it was raw. It didn't make you feel almost i mean francis chan makes you feel like you're not a christian every time you talk you <laughs> yeah. just feel like i don't love god like that guy i feel like i'm supposed to and maybe i'm not really yeah um and so but the next generation man we 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 loved that and so it went from like a sacred event to uh, i would say an awesome event we're trying to make it cool and relevant to or just like comfortable and our kids are safe here to like this authentic event this gathering um and i guess my last point is I think for us as the next uh, millennials, especially maybe try to make it a little bit of sacred, a little bit of awesome, a little bit authentic, but especially like a cause, like a movement, uh, mm-hmm. something to go change the world. But I would also say the shadow for us is that we try to make it cool. Um, yeah. We tried to make being a Christian cool. Uh, mm-hmm. We loved the Carl Lentz's of the world. And today we love like the Chad Beach. We love when Justin Bieber is a Christian and doing Christian stuff. We love when Kanye West is making Christian stuff. Like we love when Christianity can be cool. Uh, but I think the shadow is we know you can only be so cool and say die to yourself. You can only, there's some things that just aren't cool. Like even as a Christian, I'm like, man, God, we got to talk about this on the other side. Like I, I wrestle with this um, part. Mm-hmm. And um, I guess I'd say, yeah, you can't, be like the world and win over the world. And what I love about Gen Z, long way to say, I'm seeing, it's almost like because they're seeing so many of their friends um, and there's just no resort, but to be a missionary and to be on fire for Christ, it's just no, a lot less casual Christianity that I think of Charles Spurgeon quote, you're either a missionary or you're an imposter. Mm-hmm. And I think that's more of the, uh, for next gen, more and more, even now for millennials where it's like, you're either in and you're all in or you're out. Like there's no reason to be um, in the middle. And even, I think the enemy's losing, at least in this, that we may have less Christians than before, but the next generation that are Christian, I think there's a lot more of them that are just all in. And I really, 
appreciate their their fervor and and the, the desire to not just be cool enough but like to just preach the gospel to rely on the spirit of god to move and a real real biggest thing i see is this desire for revival mm. yeah grant that's so good and super helpful even like how you laid out like the history of the church and what you've seen in trends and movements i think that's like extremely helpful and um especially for me as a church leader um in a place like austin um where we have so many types of um churches that are still kind of like you know bible belt type of mm -hmm. like churches where it's like we're doing a little bit of the attractional events but we're also doing kind of sacred church but uh we're also wanting to reach like the new generation um yep. and just like you said um man i've seen uh generation z um just want jesus like no strings attached um uh they don't want anything hidden with a veil like they they want yeah. jesus they want to see him move um practically uh on campuses like in their city um and i think it's just beautiful i i love it and i love what god is doing and bringing that type of revival um not just to our church but to so many churches and honestly to our nation um yeah and Luke, I love like what you were um, doing with Consecrate. Um, I, I know last minute we tried to get some of our students to kind of head out there to DBU yeah, yeah. Um, and, and go and do it. But man, I love just what I've seen from it. Um, and so being a part of Generation Z, um, but also being a leader, honestly, for Generation Z and just your hope and your fervor for seeing them love Jesus with everything. Um, I'd love to hear like, kind of your thoughts about just as, like I said, as Generation Z, like thinking about the things that uh, Grant was just talking about with like the future of the church, uh, the needs like for not just reaching Gen Z, but like honestly cutting them loose um, from maybe the ways that we've traditionally done things. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would agree with Grant where I, it, it feels like there's this just like radical kind of undercurrent that's in the heart of Gen Z of they like we want something that is just that total stripped away like I am all in for Jesus and I think as much as we can call them into that that's what seems to resonate the most but honestly I think that's the message that has always resonated with the church throughout history because that's the gospel right it's like a call to forsake all and follow Jesus like that's the gospel and, um, but there's, there's this particular level, it feels like of them latching onto that and getting it. Um, and I think it, as much as, um, we can continue, like the reason our whole ministry is called consecrate, right? It's like this call to consecration that we define as a separation from the world and a separation for Jesus mission. And this, this idea of, I think in the past where even I'm seeing more of a hunger for things like holiness and this, this, this desire to be set apart from the world and where before it was kind of this um, taboo subject almost of like, don't talk about holiness because no one will want to hear it. And it just scares everybody, but there's this real desire of like, no, we want clean hands and pure hearts. And so, I, you know, even with talking about, okay, how, how do we mobilize? How do we, um, just get into strategy with Gen Z and things like that. We were talking about this a little bit, Grant and I, at a conference we were at yesterday. But I, I think one of the things I've seen, um, it, and we were talking about this with some other just church leaders with the, kind of the differences between the generations, is it, it's almost like there's been a hesitancy over the past few years to start empowering young leaders and, and giving them the, the, um, the platform to lead and to even I think specifically around like preachers and who who's who's next up to preach who's next up to teach um and so there's a lot of these ministries almost going hey where's our bench like with people that could rise up to preach to teach to to reach the next generation to evangelize like where are our evangelists and um they're kind of just waiting for like one to pop up and be this great preacher or evangelist or teacher or preacher overnight and um, I don't think they're going to get that without reps. And so I think we have this I, this kind of um, split between people mistaking delegating for empowering, 
where I think there's been a lot of leaders that are like, oh yeah, I need to delegate to the next generation, but I would more so define delegating as giving them things you don't have time for of like, Hey, I don't have time for this. So I'm going to give this to a young person to do where I would say empowering would be more so giving them things you honestly want to do yourself, but you choose to take a step back and go, uh, I'm going to give them the opportunity to do this and give them feedback on it. And, um, you know, John Maxwell has this great quote if he says that um, the best leaders don't gain influence by hoarding it, but by giving it away. And if it, I, I kind of have this posture of like with even young guys that I'm leading is if you give them influence, they'll give you influence. And it's like, if you empower them, give them opportunities to lead, give them platform, there's this level of they will get you in with the next generation. Shane Pruitt, who's the next gen director for the North American Mission Board, says the, the best person at reaching another young person with the gospel is a young person on fire for Jesus. And so I think as much as we can empower and and um, rather than just delegating, there's this level of that's how you're going to get influence with the next generation. So those are a couple of things that I feel like we're seeing. And, and this, there's this trend, I feel like the separation of 30, 40 years ago, you felt called into ministry, you felt called into reaching the next generation. It was a, this immediate, hey, let's find ways to help you do that and empower you to do that. And over the past 20, 30 years, it's been more so, hey, we need you to wait till you're 30 to start preaching, to start evangelizing. Um, so there's just a couple of things that we're seeing. You know, and to even think about the, I mean, you think about the traditional way, at least in Southern Baptist culture, which is mostly who's, who's listening to this is it's, you know, it was kind of, Hey, there's a call to ministry. Um, Mm -hmm. there is, you go to college, then you go to seminary and then you Mm -hmm. go get in a church. And so you're, when you look at all that together, you're looking at a, basically it's seven, eight years before you even get even a role to do, to do that. And you look at, you know, the way that, the, the speed of culture today, it just yeah. doesn't, it just doesn't fly. I mean, even when I was, I came out of the, uh, you know, save when I was 23, um, mm-hmm. went to college for one year and it was so, for me, it was like, it just, it just didn't move fast enough in some ways. So like I did it online and then just did ministry, um, yeah. to go along with it. So, yeah, I think there's, there's some structural things that have been in place for years and years and years that are yeah. that are going to have to adapt to, like you said, empower, um, empower the next generation. So great stuff, guys. Um, hey, Grant, I, I'd love to, you know, Q ideas. It, it helps, you know, with faith and culture. And so typically church is always behind culture. Um, and so in light of what you're witnessing, where do you think the, the church is kind of missing it in, ter- in terms of being um, like a faithful witness to the next generation? Yeah, that's good. Um, I think probably missing it two ways, I would say, is one, um, we allow, even for myself, I'll actually be honest, for myself, as I've joined Q Ideas and I see that they talk about all the different topics, the, they, they really try to look at what are what are the current issues in our nation, and then let's do about 30 to 40 talks from the best experts of faith in those fields. And it's probably about 90 80 percent not pastors but like from scientists to to uh, i mean we would they talked about COVID stuff and they had francis collins who's uh dr fauci's boss he's like above mm-hmm. him and having him talking about it it was like it's pretty cool to see who they have talk. they're talking about like abuse or like a scandal with women in uh men in leadership or like kind of some of the me too stuff and they had the the first girl that was in the uh, I think it's Rachel Hollander is her name and mm-hmm. she was um with that that uh, Olympic, uh, Olympic know, yeah. medic or doctor yeah and just I'm like man it's, I'm really impressed by who gave uh, just a lot of thought into and um, who he brings in to speak on these topics and it's so profound but what I've realized when I joined because I wasn't too involved in culture myself and I would this may not be the sentiment of all next gen people but I had this sentiment of like look. I see my parents and my grandparents, especially so involved and glued to the TV, watching what's going on in culture, whether it's CNN or Fox, if we could little, belittle it to just two major groups or sides, if you will. And what's ironic is neither of those sides seem really happy with the results of being that connected or engaged. So I'm like, doesn't seem worth it to me. Doesn't seem <laughs> worth it to like, okay, be very involved in this so I can be unhappy and frustrated all the time and not yeah. another half the half of America. Uh, the other half of America, I guess. And so I've kind of thought, man, I'll just pray. 
I was focused on making disciples and God will work it out. And and I think God's turned a leaf from my heart as I've seen more of what's going on and thinking. Uh, and part of it too is because I saw so many different issues as political. And now I, I'm not seeing things as political. I see a lot of things as biblical. Um, mm-hmm. It's political if I just try to take talking points from one side or the other, but um, this would go into the second thing is, so first thing is I think we, allow culture to tell us this is a political topic instead of telling them no this is a biblical topic Mm. if this impacts the imago day then this is something god god has a heart for and therefore his people do too and then two would be um i saw a study i wish i could tell you the exact numbers i don't want to i could just say with confidence this that it was barna i was at a meeting and it was literal literally george barna not the barna group it was like george Mm. barna himself so i'm like yo this is the guy and he was doing a study saying uh where they said they found this was in 2020. And so they said that it was like the majority. I want to say it was at least for sure above 80%, where it said 80%, 80 plus percent of pastors in America believe uh, co- with confidence that God's word speaks into every current issue um, that's being talked about in the election. Uh, but uh, it was less than 80%. It was like um, maybe, I think it was like 9%. Uh, but again, just hear me, that was low percent. But it was like, Basically, about 80 plus percent know God's word confidently speaks into every topic of the election, but only um, like 10 percent are are talking into those topics um, mm, yeah. of what's going on in the election. And so um, what I'm not saying is I think Christians should uh, speak into the election, but I do think we should inform, show what does God's word say um and and there's definitely again it's, it's it might be us having to be and never in probably american church history have we had to be wise as serpents and innocent as doves mm-hmm. in having to address these things but i'll just say this is when the world is talking about what's current and what's happening and what's impacting people and you got a generation that really wants to change the world and they care about the hurting and they care about people and then the church that we have always known is supposed to change the world and cares about people is silent on all the things that are current and impacting people it starts making the church and pastors feel like out of touch with Mm -hmm. what is current and so um i i'm not saying i have the answers on how to do that well but i really appreciated how q tries to guide um yeah guide pastors and being thoughtful Mm -hmm. biblical winsome um but we we really care about tone especially Mm -hmm. like uh we don't just (laughs) It's, it's unfortunate how many um, people on both sides have gained huge platforms over the last couple of years. And uh, the biggest way they do that is by putting down so badly and humiliating another mm-hmm. side. And so mm-hmm. uh, I think that's where actually the church could lead where like we're, I think the church is way more hungry, even if without knowing for, <laughs> I don't know if this is a little off, but like there's a reason why people love Ted Lasso. And there's a reason why people <laughs> love like, this is us. Um, and these these shows that aren't dark and gritty, I feel like uh, maybe going on a tangent a little bit, but I, I really I'm a big show and movie guy. And I feel like, man, every show and movie today, it's like, especially show, it's like it's got to be so dark. It's like Ozarks. And I feel like Breaking Bad really made that happen. It's like, yeah, this, oh, you get to see the, 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 the depth of darkness and how it happens. And, and I really do appreciate that. And House of Cards started doing that. And now it's like every movie from Game of Thrones to the big ones. Uh, Walking Dead was a big one. Uh, mm-hmm. Ozarks is a big one right now. It's just like the good guy is kind of not really that good either. Yeah. And so when you see just a good guy like Ted Lasso, you're like, whoa, man, that's just, just I just want this. It's a like, <laughs> yeah, I want, I want that. I think, man, we could, it'd be great to have some pastors. Like, how do you? Again, wise as serpents, innocent as doves, like the innocence of that goodness. But we're not compromising. We're not silent. We, we There's places where God cares about and we need to speak into those things. Um, Ted Lasso, I love when there, you get to see the, 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 the stern side. He's like, no, no, I'm not going to do that. Even Bob Goff, I mean, young generation, loves that guy. And I've seen some times where he's like, no, I care about this. And no, this. And, and if you could do so much on the side of innocence so that when you got to be uh, wise or stern, then um, you know, man, this guy's got a huge heart. This this pastor has a huge heart. This church has a huge heart. When they lay down the law like on this, it's it's because God must really, really care. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is justice that He cares about. Yeah, uh, man, 
you're so right about the I, I just saw the Batman last night. I don't know. This podcast is gonna like you know, I'm seeing it tonight. <laughs> first off, fire. Um mm-hmm. uh but yeah, you're totally right about that trend about like when Breaking Bad kind of started, you have yeah. Dark Knight, you have all these kind of gritty um yeah. gritty movies where the heroes are really like man like i don't know they kind of border the line between hero villain just have a lot of dark yeah. but um but and i think about that with like the generation of pastors that you were talking about earlier um where i i think our culture as a whole we're just wanting like at that time like wanting people to just tell us like what to do tell us what's right and wrong if you got to yell at us that's great and we were like clapping for those people mm-hmm. um, we were I think we kind of feel beat up now. <laughs> I think that um, the reason why, you know, people like John Mark Comer, um, Rich Velotis are like, kind of like more like voices on a come up, man, they're talking about like emotional health, like Pete Scazzaro, yeah. they're talking about, um, they're talking about uh, healing from burnout. They're talking about slowing down your yeah. life, embracing margin. Yeah. And um, I think a pastor that's done this well um, in, that did this well in his life is Eugene Peterson. Um, it seemed like he really embraced the idea of being faithful over famous um, and that he took that posture as a pastor. And I feel like over time, like people, people did not talk about Eugene Peterson like 10 years ago, like they talk about him now. Mm-hmm. Um, and it seems like that's kind of the type of leader that maybe the next generation is looking for, someone who's faithful over famous. But I would love to hear from like both of you guys whatever you have like man what what kind of posture what kind of like traits um does it take as a leader to engage this next generation and empower this next generation you know i think there is there's a really interesting book i don't know if any of you guys have read it but it's called um the starfish and the spider and it's it's this leadership uh, book, but there's a, a really fan, like really interesting and fantastic concept that he brings out in the book of the structure of organizations. But there's one story that he tells specifically that I think is a really great example of the type of uh, leaders that that Gen Z is looking for. Is there? Uh, he, he uses the example of when Cortez landed in the Americas, and he, you know, he first encounters the Aztecs, and the way that the Aztecs were structured was they had this king Montezuma. And essentially, this, uh, this entire empire, the Aztec empire that existed for thousands of years, Cortez kills Montezuma and it disappears in a, like a month's time. It just completely disintegrates. And then they go up further and they encounter the Apaches, which is a completely different structure of how their leadership works. It wasn't this king who was like, I'm the dude and everything trickles down from me, but their leadership structure was was around these guys that they called Nantans. And Nantans, um, like if you've ever heard of Geronimo, Geronimo was an Apache Nantan. And so the way that this was structured was nobody followed a Nantan because they had to. Like there was no, this kind of this legal structure of the Nantan is in leadership and you have to follow this dude. They followed the Nantan because they wanted to. And essentially what would happen is if they decided they didn't want to follow the Nantan, they could leave and follow a different one. Or um, if the what eventually happened is when um, Cortez and the Spaniards tried to knock him out and kill him, is they started killing the Nantans. But what would happen is rather than killing Montezuma and it disappearing, they'd kill a Nantan and five more would pop up, which kind of makes me think of like underground church in China, right? Like you've got mm-hmm. these leaders who are leading networks bigger than any church in America. Nobody's ever heard their name. They take out one of the, the the uncles in China, and fifty more pop up in their place. And so, I think the type of leader that Gen Z is looking for is these ones that they would follow these Nantans because they exemplified what it meant to the, the bravery or the they would go first. Like they're on the front lines. Like they're the ones going first. They're the one exemplifying everything that it is that they're preaching. They're like, hey, we got it. We've got to unify. We've got to go up against what's happening. And they're the ones on the front lines giving their lives and dying in battle. And like, like, you know, talking about current stuff right now, like you want to talk about a Gen Z leader that everybody right now in this generation is looking at is Zelensky in Ukraine. Like this dude that's on the front lines, like he's not leaving. He's like, I'm here. I don't care what happens to me. I think that's the type of leader Gen Z is looking for, not one that they have to 
that they have to follow, but one that exemplifies everything that they like deep down really want to do, but has the bravery and courage to do it. Like whether that's radical holiness or whether that's standing for justice when it's extremely unpopular or whatever it looks like, that's the type of leader that's inspiring and grabbing the hearts of Gen Z and that they're following. And um, I, I mean, that's that's the type of leader that Jesus was, right? It's like they, these people were following Jesus. He didn't have any type of structure that commanded their their allegiance other than I want to follow this man. Like there's something about this guy that's so captivating and he's he's practicing what he preaches. And I think that's the type of leader that's going to lead Gen Z forward. Um, and so that's that I think has been something that I've been really kind of captivated by that idea and that concept as of recently. And I think a lot of other Gen Zers are as well. Hey, hey Luke, there's, as I hear you talk, um, there seems to be a real focus on like leadership is a, something that, that you're really passionate about Gen Z as far as following. And it's the idea of, of desiring, I, I want to follow someone, not because I have to, because I want to, and these like flattened leadership structures. I'm just curious, could you articulate, um, why is that leadership such a focus? Like what's, um, like why would, cause I think this, this is something that I think a lot of older generation. And I think even as I, uh, get, get older, um, I'm 35. My, I told my wife, I said, I'll be 36 this year. She said, you'll be middle-aged. I said, no, that ain't, ain't middle-aged. Like, so you'll be over the hill. Like, no, nah, not yet. Uh, but as I get older, I, I think I see, you know, I, I think I feel the, I don't know the right, right way to say it, but as far as like, you know, flat leadership versus a top down, if you have a top down leader, like a top leader, that's really not a great leader, then man, it can be a really bad place and environment to work for and to thrive in. But, you know, flat, obviously that, that moves the responsibility. Uh, but I've also seen, I guess the good and bad in both of those in that if it's flat, yeah. you know, if not everyone's in unity, then man, it can get pretty chaotic yeah. pretty quick. Yeah. So why do you think, I guess the basic question I'm asking you is, is why is leadership such the issue that it is? Because that seems to be the number one thing I hear come up over and over and over again. Yeah. And you mean like the issue that it is, like, why is it such a struggle with Gen Z, like leadership wise, or why do you think it's such an important emphasis or? Yeah, I think, uh, why it's, um, why it's such a, um, so, so say the first thing you said again, sorry. I have one so like, like, is it, are you asking like, why is it such a struggle with Gen Z to kind of figure out how to lead them or more so why is just leadership in general so important? Yeah. The, yeah. Why is it, you know, leading Gen Z? Cause I, I think as I was a young 27 year old guy, I felt like whoever was leading me, um, mm -hmm. that I was like, I defaulted to wanting to put my complete trust in them mm -hmm. and just to follow yeah. them and believe that they were benevolent until they told me yep. they weren't. Yeah, and then yeah. that's for me where I was like, we need to, this needs to be tear down because now I, and maybe that was just, you know, me not realizing that the that there can be ceilings that someone can put on you and mm -hmm. with something flat that gives you seems to be more room and capacity to grow so yeah but i yeah so why I, I guess is is as i look at the next generation i keep seeing them say i'm like man when i was that age i wanted to love and trust someone to lead me i wanted yeah, to put yeah. my hope in them and that they would develop me and release me but that just doesn't seem to be the case i just wonder why that's such is it from leaders that you've seen and government or churches or what, what's the experience yeah. behind it? Yeah, I think it'd be a few things. I think one, there's just a general complete distrust of leadership that has really grown up within, I think particularly the past 20 to 30 years from everywhere in culture. I mean, you talk about politics, like, it, you know, you think seventies, eighties, people are like, generally our politicians are pretty good. You know, they, they want the best. And now it's like, there's just a, every young person is like politicians are completely fake and i think that's trickled into also so there's just an entire distrust of authority then you get into the church and you talk about the the fallouts that have happened with major leaders that our generation it seems like they've been so close together in our generation mm -hmm. that it's just like there it is again there it is again there it is again and so there's just this general distrust of leaders um particularly male leaders and i think um you know, just like Grant was talking about, even the all the scandals that have happened within the sports world with with male leaders, like 
So I think there's just one, this, this general distrust of leadership. And then I think there's also been where we've moved into more of just ideologically more of a post-Christian culture. I think the past, you know, the past decades, there was more of a biblical understanding of the fact that leadership and, and leadership structure is actually a, a biblical thing. And so there was this level of, okay, I may not necessarily agree with this leader on everything, or uh, I don't really have a reason to distrust this leader if you go back you know, a few decades either. And I also understand what the scripture says about all authority is from God. And, um, and so I think once you've moved out of that word, you know, biblical illiteracy, like they have no concept for leadership being something that we're called to submit to um, and, 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 you know, serve and, and submit to. So those two things, they have no like ideological concept for why that is something they should do is submitting to a leader. And then also a giant mistrust of leaders to where there's like, well, there is absolutely no reason for me to do that is kind of where I think Gen Z is at. And so um, I'll say like personally, as a Gen Zer, I firmly believe in the biblical concept of submitting to leaders. Um, but most of Gen Z doesn't get that. And then I think why is, um, is leadership so important is you know, talking about, I think Craig Rochelle is the one who, who says this and kind of brings this out a lot, but he's like, every organization rises or falls with the leader, like leadership, the, the, mm -hmm. and that's something I think about all the time for myself is leading an organization. Like if I'm not getting better, if I'm not re-educating myself how to reach Gen Z, like I will be the cap mm -hmm. to what we do. Yeah. Um, Cause whether I want to or not, whether I try to empower and, and delegate and, and bring in people on our team or not, like I will eventually be the cap if I don't learn how to engage. And so those are, I guess, kind of the things that, that, we're seeing, I think, the kind of the reason behind it, and then um, just the importance of it. And I, so, and I think twenty years ago, there. So, there's like positional authority, relational authority. Twenty, yeah, yeah. thirty years ago, your position and your title carried some weight. That's almost yeah, like yeah. zero now um, in yeah, any position. Yeah. Like you have to gain that relational equity, and if yeah. you don't, and I, I think, and that's where you know, I think emotional intelligence is probably one of the greatest, you know traits of a next generation leader of being able to navigate yeah. people that yeah. if you don't have that like position is, is just don't care unless you can build that yeah. relational equity so yeah worry, Luke. yeah i was if i was gonna say uh, as well i was talking with grant about this yesterday is i think one of the other things that gen z looks at to determine validity of a leader which is funny and and we'll we all think it's kind of stupid but it's it's the reality is social media following yeah. Like if uh, I think organizationally, like and positional, like if, if you had a position 20 years ago, that's what determined this person is worth following. Hey, where did, you know, even, you know, pastors, leaders, where did you go to school? Yeah. What's your degree in? Um, what organization were you in? What's your position? And for Gen Z, you hop on Instagram, you have a hundred thousand followers and you've never done anything in your life. And you have somebody that has a PhD from the most <laughs> prestigious uh, seminary in the United States, leads the largest church in the United States, but has a hundred Instagram followers. Yeah. They're going to listen to the hundred thousand Instagram followers. Like that's how they determine um, who should be listened to and, and authority. Essentially, like authority is based on social media following, which goes into a whole nother topic of I think the obligation that we have to engage on social media. As much as like I personally hate social media. And would completely delete all of it if I could. Um, but something I've wrestled with of, I think it, it, it's a necessity that we have to get into because it's how Gen Z is determining authority. And if we leave that space open, it, you know, nature hates a vacuum. So it's like something else is going to fill it if the church doesn't. Um, but it's just such a fascinating how the ideology around who has authority has completely flipped. <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah I, would, I would love to just ask both of you guys I get, grant like i i i know you know so many like leaders and so many like just christian leaders across the nation i have few instagram followers lots of instagram followers um but then we're also hearing this thread of like faithfulness um over you know maybe platform and and being famous like uh and i'm only asking grant first and luke feel free to hop in um 
uh but yeah like where's kind of where's the line or what what does it look like to I guess balance those things well because I guess we've seen like you said Luke we got receipts from these leaders over the past 20 years and we're seeing that like man like a lot of these people chased being famous and having a platform and doing all these things, but not holiness. But yeah. now it seems like that that might be a little bit of what's happening with social media. So I don't know. I'm I'm just wondering, like, man, like, what's the balance? Like, how like how does someone actually test if someone's a good leader um, in in the social media world? Right. I'd love to hear what you have to say about that. Mm, good question. Uh, I say two things. One is uh, we can demonize online influence or we can leverage it for the kingdom. And uh, there's a lot of pitfalls in, in online influence. And yeah, yeah as you know, I, I, I do a lot of retreats to give healthy spaces for guys with, I mean, literally, I, I actually did a, for the like 700-ish young leaders that have come to our dinners or retreats, they had, it was 220 million online reach. Um, I'm like, man, they are, you can really do something with this group. <laughs> um, but, uh, and, and, you know, you, you can act, this is not all, but yeah, a lot of them need shepherding just as everybody, as much as everybody else. Um, and um, I just try, I would say to the online influencer, I'm always like, dude, I'm trying to really, affirming them how much like remember who you were uh before all this like blew up and why you got into it and uh, also you, you don't you could never post another thing again um and god would still love you and a lot of the same thing i think every christian leader struggles through whether you're a good speaker a good pastor a good nonprofit leader um just the irony that pre-christ we ran from god and tried to find our identity in something else than him then by the grace that got rescued to him, we go a couple months, maybe years, and for at least high capacity Christian leaders, we then find another thing in Christ that we can do for him. And then we pair those two together like, oh, this is my new thing, but now it's good because it's for Christ. And we eventually start really focusing on that thing we're really good at. So anyone who gets that wrestle with his most strong Christian leaders, it's the same thing for an online influencer. Um, I see the gospel movement of, all that is it's an air game um, and a ground game and so if i'm talking to the guys that have the big messages yeah they can do a lot um of getting a message out there but it can't always go to the depths of discipleship and the depths of transformation but getting a message out there i mean is really helpful still like um i there's a lot of things we can see in history of um yeah just getting messages and concepts out there uh I think the best thing they can do is, it says, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. I would say, man, if you guys can kill it at then setting the believers an example in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, that's powerful. However, for the guy, I have a, I have a, a billionaire that once uh, gave to my ministry and then followed me on Instagram. And I thought it was so cool. The one thing I thought was crazy funny, though, is, is that person has 325 followers and <laughs> i'll tell you this i i think a hundred percent of my big online influencer friends that they would trade even if one of those guys had all 220 million <laughs> they'd trade it for the billion i swear <laughs> I think they would. and yeah, so like it just doesn't translate all the same way but i think man i think i love the, the diversity racially of of God's people, the diversity denominationally of God's people, the diversity of generation, and we'll just say the diversity of industry. Um, in the world, online influencers get a ton of love and a ton of respect. In the world, I think preachers and speakers get way more respect than disciple makers do and then missionaries do. And so it's the same in the church. We, we highly over glorify certain gifts and yeah. often undervalue the ones that are probably like what we see in the book of acts and what yeah. we see with the, the the new testament with jesus the disciples uh i just try my best to be like all right god there's i'm not gonna say there's right or wrong because i mean there's definitely celebrity in the bible i there is a, a new move of trying to like kill the idea of christian celebrity i, I i'm fine with like christians i guess the celebrities that like don't need it don't have to have it 
and they would give it up in a second. But as long as they have it, they're going to use it for the gospel boldly. Um, because Jesus was a celebrity, Paul was a celebrity. Uh, a lot of guys, I mean, I think every prophet in the Old Testament was pretty celebrity. Um, the fact that they went around Jericho and Jericho was actually afraid of them because uh, there was some celebrity around what God had done with them. Uh, as long as it's like God's at the center of rising um, and maybe even bringing down and their, their soul's not attached to it. I, I, um, it's all different strategies of uh, making God known, making God uh, in a deep relationship. That's, I don't know, that's my thoughts, but I, I'll just say, especially too, it's like the uh, Christian pastors, nonprofit leaders, the ones that don't have the big online influence, there's a lot they can do in encouraging and just being a simply a friend to the, the online influencers, just like they can do with actors and actresses. Um, I was talking to uh, Bishop Claude Alexander, a large, predominantly black church in uh, Charlotte, awesome, wise sage of a man. And I was just telling him, man, if you ever came and spoke into my group, you'd find, though they have like millions of followers and they're in Hollywood or they're just professional athletes or doing all this cool stuff, you'll realize, and Mitch, you got to see this. These guys, you know, I talk to them and be like, man, you, you, you got a ton of people watching what you're doing, but you're kind of remind me of just a college kid. Like, you don't know how to have a calendar. Uh, like, you don't know how to uh, like, do some basic stuff because uh, you are still that age. And, and I remember uh, this was just like three weeks ago. And he said, yeah, he said, I used to uh, preach pretty regularly to the, the, I think it was the football team, um, the NFL football team. And as it, with the chaplain would bring me in. And he would always tell me, don't adultify these guys just because they're millionaires and they're professional athletes. He's like, don't adultify them. Like they think of them just like you would preach to someone who was in college or right out of college because all the things except for their money and their fame and their online influence and uh, all that, they got all the same issues a post-college kid is going to have. Uh, so talk, speak exactly to that. And maybe even call them higher because of all this stuff that they have. And I, I, I found that to be extremely true for, for those people in influence. And they need friends like that that don't adultify them or mm-hmm. just uh, just celebrate them. Like, they're not impressed by them, but but do be encouraged by them. And that's yeah. what I try to do. Like, I'm not going to diss your your fame, but I'm, I'm also not going to uh, – I'm not going to worship you, but I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm encouraged by you. And I, I see a lot of potential what God could do through all of it. Mm-hmm. That's good. That's a good word. Well, y'all, I think that's about all the time we have today. But so, Grant, thanks for coming on, Luke. Really appreciate you guys giving your time uh, to us. I know this is super helpful content. Absolutely, man. I I respect the mess out of all three of you guys. I I love doing this. This is like one of my favorite combos. Love it, man. Love it. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having us on. I really appreciate it, guys. Good to hang with you all day. You got it, bro. Mitchell, you're a great co-host, man. Let's do it again. Yeah. All right, friends. Well, thanks, uh, friends. Thanks for uh, joining the Roundup podcast. Don't forget, follow us on social media at SBTC Collegiate. That's on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. And uh, I guess we'll uh, see you next time. Thanks, y'all.